Hello, I'm Paul Cowling with Film Independent and welcome to this week's Coffee Talk. Uh, for those who don't know, Film Independent is the organization behind the Film Independent Spirit Awards. That's the big show the day before the Oscars on a tent on the beach in Santa Monica. But we also produce many year-round conversations, screenings, panels, workshops, and filmmaker labs. So you can check us out at filmindependent.org. Memberships open to everyone. So this week, uh, we're thrilled to have two big uh, TV directors, both Emmy-nominated directors who've helmed episodes of some of the top shows today. Uh, first up, he's, uh, he had directed many, many indie movies before moving into TV and has directed episodes of The Handmaid's Tale, one of my favorites, Six Feet Under, The Pacific, Here and Now, uh, which I, I miss, it's not coming back, right? We'll get to that later. Uh, Boardwalk Empire and probably the biggest show of the, of the past decade, Game of Thrones. Uh, most recently, he's directed On Becoming a God in Central Florida, which starts its second season next month. Uh, Jeremy Podest was with us. Hey, Jeremy. Hi. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Well, you know, <laughs> how, are we, how are any of us doing? I think <laughs> where, we're are you, helping. where are you logging in from? Uh, I'm actually in lovely Lake Arrowhead, about 90 minutes outside of L.A. Um, I think L.A. was doing my head in a little bit. And thankfully, we have a place up here. So we basically moved out here and uh, have been kind of um, hiding out, I guess, from the rest of the world for the last few months. And quite happily so, actually, all things considered. It's easier to forget we're in a pandemic if you're up there, right? Well, yes and no. Unfortunately, the news feed still comes to us. And, you know, it does feel a little bit remote, but it's definitely in our consciousness all the time. Right. Uh, when I asked Jeremy to uh, participate in the coffee talk and asked him who he'd want to be joined by, he said, well, my good friend, uh, she is the director of uh, Transparent, Mr. Robot, You, Me, Her, uh, Better Things, Dear White People, all such great shows. Uh, her feature Late Night was one of the big hits of Sundance 2019, and her latest film, The High Note, is now playing online. Our good friend Nisha Ganatra is here. Hey, Nisha. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's, it's, uh, that's just the new answer now. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> are, you LA? are you in LA? I am in LA, yes, where the numbers have totally flat lines, so we're all good here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy and I, meanwhile, last night, we're like, thank God we have Canadian citizenship. We're going back. <laughs> That's right. You're both Canadians. Well, I, yes. I that in my intro. <laughs> so the way this works, uh, the Coffee Talks, is I'm going to step off this virtual stage and let the two of you chat, sort of filmmakery, chit-chat, shop talk uh, conversation. Uh, I will come back to fields of questions. So people listening in, if you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and submit questions, uh, we'll get to those in about half an hour, but for now, uh, I'll let the two of you take it away. Great. Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> good, it's good to see you. Nice to see you too. It's nice to have this opportunity to just have a little chit chat. Yes, for um, sure. I was wondering if we could start just talking about COVID a little bit, because I mean, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds and all of that stuff, but yeah, I know. You know, I know you, like me, are a person who works all the time. Yes. You have a very busy active life and you've got kids and everything. You know, what was it like suddenly when everything stopped for you? Um, you know what's so weird is everything didn't really, so I feel like everything stopped for a week and then um, nothing really stopped so much because it, uh, I think the movie, you know, I, our, I just finished the high note. It was gearing up to be released May 9th. And then suddenly it was just a big scramble of what do we do? How is it going to be released? How do we shift gears? Like this sort of big heroic effort of everybody to do the right thing, which was not put it in theaters and try to encourage people and keep people safe. So I feel like that took away all the, I had something very concrete to be working on. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also had just started this um, um, like, production deal at um, ABC Studios. So that was also like, it felt like this pandemic hit, suddenly everybody was like, oh, I'm watching everything. I've watched everything on Netflix. And I was like, I am still not watching. What's happening? Why am I not watching? But I think you said it with kids, like people with kids, it's 
it's not been relaxing at all. <laughs> like everybody else seems to be having some amazing renaissance of like baking and I don't know, like cooking very complicated things. And we're all just like trying to keep our shit together and like, you know, look up why it's okay for your kid to watch TV for 10 hours a day. <laughs> it's just like, it's this Maybe insane. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> and I'm now talking about the high note. I mean, I'm so curious because yeah. you're one of the few people that have had that experience of having a movie that was ready to go into theaters and then this. So, yeah. Just, I, you know, practically and emotionally, what was that like for you? It's so weird because, well, you know, like the goal, because you come from indie film too. So you make your movie, then you hope to get in a festival, then you hope to sell it, then you hope they put it in theaters. So when something goes right um, to VOD, the feeling inside is that you like, you know, blew it and that your film sucks and that you're a loser because you didn't get a theatrical release, you know? So it's weird to kind of like ch change that mindset of like, oh wait, no, it's not. It's like everybody's film is going VOD right now. And, um, and I think it's, it's tricky because I think they did it with Trolls and they made, you know, a lot of money doing it. And then we were, we felt like we were kind of the first, um, like live action experiment of going VOD. So that was, you know, not, not, not awesome, but not terrible. <laughs> it was kind of a, the weirdest thing for me was when the movie opened and it felt like nothing, like, cause you're going, well, also what happened was the weekend it was opening, the amazing protests and uprising happened in our country. So really everything just became who gives a shit. We're all focused on this now, you know? And then, um, because we also have a predominantly African-American cast, so it really was the, the, the topic of, and the right topic, you know? So it kind of became um, secondary in some way, like first the pandemic, then the civil rights movement, now, you know, then it was like last, the sort of what's happening with VOD and will theater survive and is this the final death now for movie theaters or if you're super optimistic like me do you think everybody will realize how much they've missed this communal experiment and uh, experience and start going to movie theaters again when we can well i think for me like i did watch it on the opening weekend and it still yeah. felt like an opening weekend oh like, good like on vod but i think because for me i want to see other people watch it like i was like i don't want to watch it again i just you know when you by the time you finish your movie you've seen it a hundred times in the dark room by yourself or the mix and the sound and the color and the vfx and the so by the time you are you're so ready to see an audience watch it and you the last thing you want to do is sit in the dark and watch it alone again <laughs> so. but i think for the audience it was still nice in a way because it felt very fresh you know and I think we're all catching up on things if we don't have kids and we're <laughs> and then to have something that was like oh new new and it's like and it's you know and it's from you from a serious filmmaker and it's got a really interesting cast and uh -huh. it was have that suddenly appear and I was like oh great finally it's something you can just uh -huh. yeah, and it feels really fresh and great thanks Jeremy thank you sweet and how is it for your cast like do they like for Tracy Ellis Ross and for Dakota Johnson do they have I mean, it's a new thing for them, too, to have a movie open that way. Yeah, I think, I mean, I felt the most, uh, I think, for Tracy, because it's her first feature. She had been waiting a really long time to have her big screen debut, and then here it was on small screens again. So I think, though, but they were just so, um, you know, adaptable and uh, instantly understood, like, this is a really crazy, unique, hopefully unique period we're in. And... Um, yeah, it was just, it was just so cool. Like they were, everybody was figuring out, like she debuted her song on Instagram and we were watching this live feed of Instagram with like Michelle Obama and Diana Ross and all this. And we were just like, what is happening? And then uh, it made us miss what our premiere party would have been like, because we know all those people would have been there and it would have been insane. Um, but then like Dakota was doing sort of a talk shows over the hedge of her backyard with like her neighbors. It was all everybody trying to pull together in this really funny way that, that it was really, uh, I don't know, it was so fascinating to watch. Well, you've had that singular experience. Hopefully the next one will be a different experience. Yeah, totally. Thank singular. God. <laughs> we'll like, keep going. <laughs> oh, really. Really. Um, so I did want to ask you like, has this, the reality of the world I feel like I'm interviewing you, but I, I don't I know. I was like, I don't want to be doing that, but <laughs> hopefully that's more of exchange. But 
I mean, I am curious about so many things, but, um, and I can talk about my own experience with this too, but like, has, has this whole experience affected in the future what you think you want to make and the kind of projects you're attracted to and has it changed? Was there something that you were involved in that now you feel like, ah, it's not really the right time for that now? How was that? Yeah, I think so. I was, that's so funny. I was just going to ask you that because you're sort of even more isolated up there. So you're really, um, just surrounded by the material that you chose to bring into the space of, you know, getaway. So I'm curious, like, it does make you realize like how nothing's guaranteed in life and how precious our time is. And, you know, I think we're always aware of, it takes one to two years of your life to make a movie. So is it something you really want to tell and dedicate that kind of time to? And, um, you know, I think it's made that even more intense for me. How about, how about you up there? Are you kind of reading things and thinking, you know, I always wanted to tell the story and I'm not gonna, yeah. you know, take this yeah. assignment that I thought I wanted or. There's so much of that actually right now because I am actually reading a lot of fiction right now, which is something that I haven't done in a long time. Something yeah, well, how would you have time? Cause you're reading also like you direct the, the bigger episodes towards the end of the season, which means you have to read all the scripts up to your episode. So you're reading like hundreds of pages before you are ready to do your episode. And that's like, that takes the place of reading fiction for me. Like I started, I was like, God, I haven't read anything but scripts for a year. And then I, I had to consciously make room for other reading. Otherwise it just doesn't happen. Yeah, well, fiction also just takes up it's a different kind of space in your head. Yeah. It requires silence and it requires rest and it requires time. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the jobs that I do, I have to travel for and not really home. And so, you know, just like light, balancing life and work and, you know, constant activity is really hard just to find that kind of headspace for fiction where you really need to dedicate time. But up here, I've had that space and time. So I've been reading a lot of novels and I've been looking at things that take a little bit more time and concentration and, it's been really good and it has completely changed the way I think about what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. and for me, it's been more about much more personal storytelling is what's attracting me. And so it kind of, I feel like I'm going back to my roots in a way. And yeah, like, I mean, Game of Thrones is amazing. <laughs> All these kind of shows, which are like, you know, for me, huge cinematic palette and amazing people, and adventure of making the show, and, you know, the, the, all of it's an adventure. But then like something about telling a very small and smooth story that's, you know, really nuanced, and really specific, and really personal. Not that those shows aren't in their own way personal and, and nuanced, but it's the kind of intimate storytelling that I started off making, that you and I both started off making with you yeah. with Chutney Popcorn and me with my first films. It was like, that's kind of where I'm at. And the nice thing is that what I, the project that I, that I had started before the pandemic, which is now on hold, but we're working towards rebooting, is a show called Station Eleven which is kind of both things. It's like kind of like epic and world building, but it's very, very intimate. And at the same time, it weirdly, very directly addresses the time that we're in because it's about a pandemic. <laughs> and it's, you know, the novel was written in 2014. Oh my God. Someone was, Somerville wrote an amazing adaptation of it. And, you know, they started shooting it. I wasn't involved in the first two episodes shooting, but I'm involved in the next eight episodes. But, um, sorry, I just need to turn for a second. But, you know, all of it was conceived. Those two episodes were shot before anybody heard of COVID. Wow. And, you know, when COVID started to come, it was like, this is weird. <laughs> the show we're making is about a pandemic. And it starts so similar to the way the real pandemic started. And it's almost like there was a prophetic quality to that book and the script that was very unnerving. And, so now it's like the, you know, the work that I'm doing is so clearly mirroring what's happening in everybody's lives with poetic leaps. And of course you can't match it exactly because it's a work of fiction and now we've seen how this plays out in reality. But you know, what I love about it is that it, it's not just about a pandemic, it's really about what happens many years after the pandemic is over and people now have to live with the consequences of what that has wrought. And I think many of us are thinking about how does the pandemic make us think about our lives, choices we make, what's important, what isn't important, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very weirdly, happily engaged with all the things I would be thinking about anyway, but that thought process has started before this even began. 
That's so weird that your project already. Yeah, that's so cool though. It's crazy. <laughs> it does. It is interesting how when you're directing a show, you get into the world of that show and immerse so completely that it affects your life in so many ways. You know, like I know doing Mr. Robot just made me so paranoid about everything. In fact, right now I'm looking at my computer and there's a little, the thing that slides and covers your camera and it says Mr. Robot because they gave us those on the set. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm just laughing because like, yeah, you of course you immersed into this world of what would I do in a pandemic? And now you are a couple months ahead of us with the answers. <laughs> Well, in a way, but that is, that's an interesting thing too. Is like that's kind of was the sort of imagined version of what it would be like. Now we're living the real version of how how much of a mirror is it? But so many mm -hmm. things do mirror and dovetail. It's quite weird and fascinating. I like that you talked about our our roots because I feel like that you know that thing of coming from indie film was held against us for so long and and was such a like thing of how hard it was to break in because they saw you as a, a, a smaller filmmaker, you know, and one that didn't know, like to me, it was always so obvious that if we can make a movie with these five resources, like what would we do if you gave us an actual equipment package, you know, like, like let us, let us play. And um, now though, I find like, oh, now those skills are coming really in handy because now I can say, oh, I know how to make a movie with 10 people. <laughs> you know, I know how to like, um, you know, do this without any of those, any of the sh bells and whistles because we did for so long so now in this COVID how do you shoot with the time of COVID it feels like those things are coming in um to be our big strengths that they always were our big strengths if you can make an independent film oh my god like what's harder filming wise than that you know um that was always my argument when I was trying to break in and meeting a lot of resistance and people were like yeah you know you've done these independent films and they're interesting but like I don't know if you can do like a you know ten day episode of a show. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I remember that because I went to shadow and sh I shadowed on a show, and I remember they were like, we "Move pretty fast, huh?" And I was like, "Not really, because you have sets. Like we didn't have sets. We had to go into a restaurant, beg them to let us film there. They said okay, but we're not closing, and then we had to shoot really fast before that person behind you left." because then it, their continuity wouldn't match because they weren't a background player because we didn't have background, you know? So I was like, no, indie film moves really fast. This is really luxurious. When, when you were starting, like, how did you bridge that? Like, how did you, people, how did things change that you managed to get those opportunities to get from there to there? I didn't. That's why even when Paul was introducing us and he said, oh, two television directors, like my a little voice in my head is still like, <laughs> It was so hard to break in, like nobody would let me direct an episode of television for ever, you know, and so it's weird now to be like identified as a television director because I still in my mind am the person that's like, let me in, you know, and can't, can't get in there. Um, but yeah, it really was like the kindness of um, this amazing friend um, who let me direct one episode of this like Nickelodeon show. And then everybody had said, if you get one, then, you know, everything will, will sort of go from there. But that was not the case. Like then it was um, really hard to get the second one. And then everyone said, oh, the second one's really hard because the first one people want to give you a break, but the second one, there's nothing to be gained from giving you a second one. And I was like, well, this sucks. Like, how am I ever gonna? So it's just like years of shadowing and minority fellowships and women fellowships and more shadowing and, you know, begging and pleading and you're trying everything. And yeah, it just, it was really, really hard. I think ultimately like Canadian citizenship came in to rescue my directing career more than anything else, you know? Oh, that's interesting. How did that happen? Well, I think cause weirdly like in Ca Canada, I believe doesn't have the same numbers of um, female directors that aren't allowed to direct <laughs> as the DGA does, you know, like it kind of is a weird um, thing. So when I know a lot of friends, when we came out of film school, like a lot of women were sort of, you know, trying to have directing careers and got pulled more into producing or writing or editing. And I think that because I had Canadian citizenship, I could go to Canada and direct. And it let me really work on my craft and really like keep practicing and you know even failing at, at many times and like getting better and better and better where um 
I think if I didn't have that Canadian citizenship, I would have been limited to fighting for the jobs here where, you know, there were so many years where it just, you couldn't break in, you couldn't break in, you didn't know why. Then you started feeling like, well, maybe I'm just not good enough. And then I remember that year that the Department of Justice and the um, EOD like brought a lawsuit against Hollywood for, you know, um, organized discrimination against women in directing. And when that happened, all the female filmmakers I knew that had been trying so hard to break in had this moment of relief of like, oh, it wasn't just me. There was, a, there was systemic discrimination going on. So it was like a very impossible wall to break through as well as being a competitive industry, you know? So I think that was like a big sigh of relief and we all could reset and think, oh, maybe I'm not terrible. Maybe there was something else kind of working against me getting in. Um, but yeah, I think the big break was Jill, when Jill Soloway um, brought me onto the first season of Transparent and we directed the first season together, the whole first season. That, that show being successful, as you know, once you get one credit of a super successful show, then all the doors, like literally the shows that were offering me shadow positions were suddenly offering me episodes and nothing had changed other than Transparent was successful, you know? So it's it's a, show, it was also great, you know, that show was kind of undeniable. And I think yeah. everybody who was involved in that show, and especially you in such a key way, being a producer and director, of course, it's gonna change everybody's perception. Yeah. For me, like when I did Six Feet Under, I think that just changed everything. Yes. So it, was, it wasn't just that it was a successful show, but it was a show that was esteemed. I mean, people really appreciated that show on a level that was really significant. Yeah. I want to hear a little of your, because I was surprised to find that you had a difficult trajectory, because to me, from the outside before I knew you, it was, you know, Jeremy made this film everybody lauded this film then alan ball like plucked him to do six feet under and then he was on the hbo you know rise to fame so it was so interesting when you were like no i couldn't get in like it was it was oh i was in the desert for a while you know it was <laughs> it was an interesting thing because i mean that is the perception but yeah. i think also because i'm i think i'm older than people think i am <laughs> <laughs> but i think you know people think you know i just you know came out of the womb you know directing six feet under and then that my life was just like a dream, you know? Yeah, After, an easy dream. <laughs> and, but in fact, you know, before that I had, you know, I struggled for many, many years and make short films and, you know, struggling in Canada, trying to get recognized. And, you know, it took me, I mean, I had many friends who were very successful in the Canadian independent film world, like yeah. Boyan and Patricia Rosema. And I was sort of like the latest bloomer of the group in a way. And so as they were all kind of exploding and in their international film careers, I was struggling to get a first film made. Wow. And I finally got a first film made called Eclipse, which went to Sundance in Berlin. And that was recognized, which was nice, but it was a very small movie. Um, and it was like the beginning of something, but then it took me another five years to get another movie made. And it was really only after that next movie that things started to shift perception-wise. And that was The Five Senses that went to the Cannes Film Festival and, um, and that really, really made a difference. And it's really a, as a direct consequence of that. Yeah. Um, the film was developed at the Sundance Screenwriters Lab and then through a, a weird series of uh, events that involved Alan Ball and Alan Poole, in fact, the producer of Six oh. who recognized the work and who had actually read my script for The Five Senses at the lab. It was a very- Oh, was, that's how, okay. That's a really cool- Yeah, I, like a, it was a crazy kind of thing. That was just it kind of goes with what you were saying about how I feel like we're telling everyone it's really easy. You just have to get into the Sundance lab. <laughs> well, the lab, and then you have to meet Alan Poole. Yeah, basically. <laughs> or, or somebody like that. But I think it's what you said because you've had mentors. You said that kind of like lifted you up, and that and I think I have mentors are just people who gave me breaks. I would say. Yeah. Because sometimes, like I do feel in my career, there have been like the exact like three or four turning points that were a direct result of somebody giving me a break. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, but they just kind of believed in me and, you know, for whatever reason, and yeah. they give you a break. And that makes a gigantic difference in your career. And so that was one of those. And that, so really I had like more than 10 years of not quite wandering in the desert, but sort of really being slightly frustrated, not knowing if it was ever gonna happen. And my sites were, my sites were not really on TV at that time either. Because yeah. you know, I really thought I'm going to be an indie filmmaker and that's what I want to be. And you know, television then wasn't what it is now. You know, when I got Six Feet Under, it was really the beginning of the change in television. It's the beginning mm -hmm. of the age. 
and it was like The Sopranos was happening, The Wire, Sex in the City, and Six Feet Under, and that was kind of it. Yeah. And those were remarkable shows, and they were changing the idea of TV. But yeah. that, I never saw a career in TV for myself because I, I just didn't see a place for myself. I was too, you know, kind of out of the mainstream in a way. Huh. So, you know, things started to shift as the medium shifted. And then I was, it was just good timing. And there were not a lot of independent filmmakers wanting to make TV at that point. And I just came in with the very, very first wave of that happening. That's really, yeah. Although Shari Freela will say that television became great on the backs of indie filmmakers, like from the 90s. Like she thinks that indie filmmakers were the ones who came in and sort of built uh, TV into what it is. I, I would agree, actually, because if you look at the, fir the first directors of all those shows, mm -hmm. all of them came from that world. Yeah. And they all ended up having amazing uh, TV careers, but they had already established themselves in a way, either in a big way or a minor way. But they showed that they were auteurish, that they had a voice, mm -hmm. um, and they were plucked. And I know that, like, you know, Alan Poole, for example, would go to Sundance for the first few years of Six Feet Under and seriously pluck out a few people. Yeah. And breaks in TV. And that made an enormous difference in a lot of people's careers. And it made an enormous difference to the shows, I think. Because for suddenly sure. there were people that were not steeped in TV making these shows. They were steeped in a different kind of... Yeah. Um, well, that's what's so interesting because when Transparent came along, I, you know, had so many years of not being able to get TV and Jill Soloway had said, I don't want to work with somebody who has a ton of TV credits. I want to work with the indie filmmaker. And then it suddenly was like all of my bad luck of not being able to get in became my good luck of, oh, I don't have a ton of TV credits. I have one or two to follow the network and a lot of indie films to be the person she wants to collaborate with. So that was pretty... It, it weirdly turned everything around. Yeah, I think for a lot of us that happened because that, that became the new thing that people were interested in. They wanted to kind of, you know, people like you, it's a different kind of voices and different, right. experience and different levels of different kinds of experience, not levels. Now I've just ruined it by having too many TV credits. <laughs> now I'm just a, now I'm just a hacky episodic director. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of being a hack. Um, <laughs> I actually did want to ask you, moving off of that, and our kind of humble beginnings, but um, about the craft of directing. Very humble presence. <laughs> like. Humble presence. It's just, uh, <laughs> I think, like what I found interesting sort of watching your career is it's so parallel to mine, like we have almost no overlap. You know, although I love the shows you do, and I imagine you appreciate the shows that I work on. Yeah, but, of course, oh my gosh. I mean, the shows you work on. Yeah. So I think, but I'm so interested in like, you know, the kind of shows you do and like how, your way into those shows and how you work on those shows and, you know, every, everything about it really, how you approach them as a director. In yeah. Comedy and dramedy, like in that area, which is kind of, if I can say. I, think, I mean, it's more just the low, I feel like, I think I was at, a, at Jamie's uh, Christmas party with you and we were, and I was listening to you talk about like these big shows you were going to go do. And I remember just being like, well, I'll never get to do a big show like that, you know, just me, I'm just doing like scrapping away in these little like indie shows, like, you know, Transparent was like a very indie show, then You, Me, Her was like, okay. Wait, I didn't hear you, sorry, what happened? There's so many people, like, I mean, I'm not going to let you soft pedal that achievements of those kind of things because oh no no they're they're they turned out like but better things also was like you know small uh small budget small cast like you know married with small budget small cast like it was all of these sort of smaller um shows that then turned out to be like artistically fantastic and and get a lot of uh, attention but were not like already chosen by the network as the show they were going to give the budget to you know what i mean so i remember it was just a lot, it was just a lot of um, scrapping, you know, still. And it, it felt um, fine because I didn't know any different, you know? And then when I did my first HBO show, I was like, oh my God, like, what is this? Like, it is insane, the like uh, resources available to you when you're like, HBO does not um, hold anything away from their directors in terms of like if you want something to do a shot, it appears like magically and there's, you know, the best line the best <laughs> Well, maybe not, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, how do you, I, I would love to just hear a nuts and bolts on how you direct like those giant sequences. Like when you read a Game of Thrones script, are you like, oh my God, like there's this giant battle. Like how do you start wrapping your head around that? Well, you know, in a word, yes, I do. Like, I think it's, you know, I've, I've been around the block a few times, but it's like sometimes I read something like, you know, the wall comes down, you know, Game of Thrones, and I'm like, <laughs> like all right, the wall's going to come down, you know, and there's going to be like an army of the Night of the Dead and a dragon, and, you know, there's a lot, you know, and it's, so, and that was already, I'd done the show, like, quite a few times at that point, I was still like, oh my God. <laughs> Like, yes, even I have those moments of like, how on earth do we do this? Yeah. And, you know, especially with a show that had reached a certain level of, you know, kind of finesse and sophistication and expertise. You can't, you know, you can't blow it on those kind of things. No, you really can't. Especially everyone's watching you on that one, really. Yeah. I mean, the first, I know I did this episode of Shameless and I remember getting the script and the first thing I read was, you know, at the end, this character is on a bridge and I was like, oh, okay, as so you get jump off the bridge. And then, then as he's contemplating jumping off the bridge, a car accident happens behind him. And then I was like, all right, a car accident. Then the car catches on fire. And I was like, okay. Then he turns and runs into the car and grabs and saves somebody from the fire. And I was like, what's happening? This was a family comedy, like a dramedy. And like, now I've got this like giant, like what's gonna, how am I, okay. You know, and then like, he, and they're on fire. Then he rolls out of fire. I was like, and then a fire truck appears and all, like all the, and you're just the director reading the script going, oh fuck, like I gotta make all this happen now. Like, you know, and you're gonna be the person everyone's coming to and like, how do we do this? And you go, yeah, but for you to be, literally read the wall falls and a night dragon and like this is the guard and the, well, it's, by the way, this is like, you know, it's a page in the script, which you know is yeah. like a 10 minute sequence in the show. And so it's like, you know, thanks for the not very many clues of how to do this, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, but I think like, you know, you having to figure that stuff out, like that, that is kind of our job, right? It's like, yeah. all directing is directing at the end of the day. And it's like, what's the story you're telling? What's the visual way you're going to tell that story? You know, what are the beats in the scene? Like even, even a scene of the wall coming down has story beats, you know, and you also have, you know, actors who are on the wall and things have to happen to them and right. have to interact with the other stuff. So you start like with everything, you just start with story and character and like, where do you want to be? And then what do you imagine your mind's eye? And then it's, and then it's like, how do you achieve that? Which mm -hmm. becomes, you know, for certain things like that, like the wall coming down, becomes a bit of a collaborative effort. You're not on your own entirely. Yeah. You do begin like with everything with like, what do I see? And then I storyboard it. And, you know, I, I tend to be like a really crappy storyboard artist. Which I was going to say, can you draw Jeremy? Cause I can't draw my story. If I draw the storyboard, it confuses people more than it. Honestly, I things. Like I an amazing storyboard artist to draw them for me. You know, I, I started like a, you know, like stick figures basically. But, you know, and which is the kind of irony in my family because I come from a family of painters. My, this is my brother's painting behind us. Oh my God. And so, you know, my brother's a highly accomplished painter. My dad was a very highly accomplished painter. His father was a painter. So it's like all these people and I can't draw at all. So I, but over the years, I've learned to communicate through drawing, which is not the same thing as drawing, but it's like, <laughs> I can do things like shapes and, and proportion and things that kind of indicate what something should look like. And then I get a storyboard as to will kind of refine those drawings so they can be shared with other people. Oh, I mean, my own drawings are just me and a DP, you know, maybe, and like, that's kind of it. Nobody else would ever see them. Yeah. Um, but going back to the bigger thing, it's like, you know, I start with like my own rudimentary storyboards, then I'll get a storyboard artist for, for big sequences we're talking about, not for, you know, two people sitting around talking. That'll be just me and my little drawings and the DP figuring things out. Yeah. But, um, for these big things, it'll be like, I'll bring the storyboard artist in, try to con convey to him what my drawings mean so he can interpret them and do a better version of those things. Right. Uh, we sort of edit those and then we present them to the producers because gigantic sequence of sequences need to be approved yeah. and then it becomes a process of like okay well there's a big shot and there's a dragon in it and there's a wall crumbling and it's like okay so how much of this is practical how much of this is visual effects we know the dragon is not practical but i think possibly the interactive fire on the set piece will be something we do with lighting but the fire itself may or may not be lighting 
Thanks for ruining it and telling us the dragon was not practical. By the way. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I think those things are so particular. And I think I lost the fear over those things over years of things like doing period shows and doing Rome and the Pacific, yeah. which involved, you know, action sequences and larger scale things where the effects are required and the coordination of elements of special effects, visual effects complicated cinematography, you know, directing, planning, and thinking. Yeah, but it, that was, I think the fun of TV is that, like I did the show Future Man that had a lot of stunts and, and mm. explosions, and um, you know, the aesthetic was to try to do them all practically. And because it's TV, like we, you know, went up on this hill behind Culver City, got a van, blew it up, you know, filmed the scene, then like all got in our cars, drove back down to the lot and kept shooting. And I was like, on a movie, that would have been all we did today. It was just blow up this van and shoot this scene. And on the TV show, you're like, great, let's keep going. Now we got three more explosions to do down there, you know? And it really does get, like, that's the thing, the practice and the, the doing it over and over and over. Now it's like, now I read explosion. I'm like, oh, fun. Let's try to figure out how to do this in a different way, you know? Where the first time you're just like, oh, wow what's going to happen? What are we doing with these Hot Wheels? <laughs> we have, uh, do you have time for some questions? We, we have some, a few submitted here. Uh, first one's not a question, but Francine says, Canada misses you both. <laughs> We're, we might be coming there faster than, faster than anyone knows. <laughs> uh, question here from Sam. He kind of touched on this. Is that how, how do you, um, did each of you find the people and funding to make your first independent feature film? Oh, uh, my first independent feature film was made on um, donations and my credit card and uh, like really just a volunteer, volunteers and all my friends from my film school class, like everybody just, you know, banded together. So I don't think, I didn't really find the, and later I found out that had I, you know, because Joel Hennessy was Canadian and I was Canadian, like if I knew there was funding in Canada to make films, I would have like gotten some real funding to make that film there. But instead we just shot it by the seat of our pants in New York City for, you know, whatever little bit we had. Was that chutney popcorn? That was chutney popcorn, yeah. How many? Uh, Jeremy, oh, by the way, Jeremy, do you have any uh, like headphones like this with a microphone on or can you, you're, you're a little faint. Um, okay. Yes. How's this better? Yeah, that's a better. So is there, I don't know if there's a volume control on the microphone on those AirPods, is there? Let's see. How's this? That's a little better, yeah. So yeah, your first. Yeah, trouble. Um, first movie? First Fun. movie was a, it was a slightly different case. I was still in, I was in Canada, like Nisha at the beginning, or could have, you were, well, you majors in New York, but. Um, in my instance, uh, I knew there was funding, but we got turned down by every funding agency in Canada to make my first movie. But I had um, kind of developed quite a bit of goodwill with a lot of people in the industry because I knew Adam Agoyan and his crews and, and Patricia Rosema and people like that. And they, there was a lot of support for me trying to get my first film made. And you know, I knew a lot of people in the acting community. And, and, the, and so I, and, and I had a script that had been circulating. People really liked it just had no money. And then we had one, one enormous break, which was that my producer, Camelia Freiberg, had produced Adam McGoyan's first four or five movies. And uh, she um, was quite well known on the international film circuit. And she managed to get a German uh, producer slash distributor to pre-buy my film based yeah. on the script. And that gave us $150,000 to actually, sh we couldn't finish the film for 150, but we could, get it in the can. And I felt like if I could just get the movie in the can, we could somehow raise the rest of the money. And that's what happened. So we, we made the film for $150,000. It was in black and white, 16 millimeter, all Canadian cast, all Canadian crew, amazing people. We did, you know, they're just an amazing job. That's so funny, because that's exactly the same budget that Chutney Popcorn was. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe that was the magic number in those days for an indie movie. It was, it was crazy, yeah. Was that the finishing amount or the, for the just Actually, getting the yeah, no, we had, I think we got like 35 grand in the bank to like, and then could shoot it. But I also had, 
the school supporting me. So it, I didn't need as much as that. I think the finishing was like, yeah, just a little over 150 in the end. Yeah, we ended up getting a little bit more. The, the agencies finally kicked in when we got accepted to Berlin. And then they didn't want to be left out of the, you know, one of the very few Canadians going to uh, going to Berlin. So uh, that ended up working out for us finally. Nice. We have a question from Jet, who asks you both. Um, first says, "So glad you're doing this," uh, and then says, um, "How do you both stay motivated on your own projects while you are both so busy with episodic directed work?" Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, it's like, you know, the, the projects that are our own that we develop and since the very beginning of my career, anyway, they just have to have legs. Like, you have to feel like I can live with this project for years because it may take years for it to get made. And there's no guarantee. And so at least if it doesn't get made, I feel that the time wasn't wasted. You know, that it was at least the writing of it, the developing of it, it kind of nurtured me somehow, or I felt like it was worth making. And, I, and those are the projects that usually do get made because they're the ones that are kind of like when all the other ideas kind of go away, those ones stick and you kind of can't let go of them and they're kind of more meaningful. So it's not, it's not that hard to stay motivated with those things, I find, if you're patient. So how, how do you tell the difference between those projects you think have that sort of longevity and the ones that you might get bored with later on? So you don't waste your time on those? Mm -hmm. For me, it's a bit as like if people say no and you still want to make it. Okay. Like sometimes like with certain things, you're like if the world is kind of saying no, you're like, okay, fine, I give up. And then other ones are like, no, I don't, I don't think this is a no. I think this is a yes. And it's like, I, I think people will come around on this thing and it's worth further developing it. But I think it's a little bit different with movies and personal projects as opposed to more mainstream TV things because in TV, I have to say no is kind of no. Like, if you hear no enough times, that's really no. Like, <laughs> maybe wait 10 years of resurrected if there's a the world changes or something. But I'm happy to, with TV projects that I develop, if they're not in the zeitgeist, or it's not the right time, it's like, okay, I can let that go. But the more personal projects are like, I feel like they'll find their time, you know? Nisha? I'm, just, I'm listening to Jeremy's advice. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that is the, that is the trick is just the things you're passionate about you make time for you know but also I find episodic directing you get a little bit of downtime in between shows so it's it's um it's an interesting lifestyle change for me the episodic because it's booked so far out in advance that you can know what your like six months is going to look like or a year you know which I found both awful when I realized that when I realized things were booked so far in advance I realized oh I'm not gonna ever break into the industry this year because everyone's already booked through the whole year and those those moments were horrifying but also now it's like you know I can plan a, um, a period of time in between shows where you know you have the next job coming I think the hardest thing for me before I got an episodic was never knowing I always feeling like my last job was my last job and there was no one ever coming again. So, um, you know, you're kind of in this thing where you're, you're doing the job you're doing, you're finishing the job you just did, you're hustling to get the next one, and there's never any sort of um, down period to focus on your own work. So I'm kind of struggling with that, like trying to figure out when to uh, prioritize my own work, because I'm so used to just chasing the thing to break in, you know, but I have to stop and be like, okay, you're, you got in. Now what? You know, it's still right there. I remember you talking last year at the forum keynote, the film independent forum, about uh, being confident and the, the, the Hollywood hammock. <laughs> yeah. Talk a little bit about that, but once you get your big break, it, the, the, the gigs don't start rolling in and just... Yeah, that's, a, that's Carol Dysinger's term. She was my film school teacher and she won the Academy Award this year, finally, again. She, she started her career winning it and then it was a long road to getting another one. Um, but she told me that when I was... Uh, she said, I think the biggest myth of Hollywood is this, this Hollywood hammock that, you know, you'll have made it and then you can just lay back in this hammock and every, all the offers will start rolling in. And, uh, you know, that 
I remember early when I moved here, I had a meeting with um, Linda Oaks and I had only read about her, you know, and seen this name and read her books and as she was this legend. And when I met her, she was just like this hardworking, hustling producer. And I remember just being like, oh my God, even Linda Oaks is still hustling. You know, like everybody is just pushing as hard as they can in this industry. And it's, um, it's really interesting to, to see the people who are successful are successful because they don't stop pushing. They're just working harder than anyone can imagine. So that's true for you as well, Jeremy? Um, I also remember the Tanak thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the idea that there's a hammock someday out there waiting for us to lie in. Um, I think, you know, we coming from the indie world, we just, you never, you know, just take things for granted ever. And, you know, we've all struggled, you know, in our past and when things get easier, and at least we're not struggling so much, you know, financially maybe, or in other ways, it's like, it's easier. But it's like, it's always like, there's always that thing you want that you have to fight for and, you know, a lot of things don't come like just like that. Um, but I'm sure for you too, things, it's better than it was because you have this body of work now that, that, you, that represents you. Um, but it's still, you know, I don't know if it's like, a, I wouldn't say it's a hustle or a grind, but it's like, it's just about not taking things for granted and, and still knowing that there are things you're going to need to fight for. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a competitive world, you know, in a healthy way, I guess. Um, but I think our, our attitudes and my attitude certainly has changed about it as I've gotten older too, because it's like that kind of hunger and, you know, passion to, to kind of like be out there in the hustle and fighting. It was like really bright when I was younger and now it's, it's there, but it's different. It's, it's become a more mature kind of like, where do I want to put my time? How do you balance film, you know, show you know, work and career and life. And I'm sure for you, Nisha and family and, you know, it's all these things. It's like, and lifestyle, where do you want to live? And do you want to travel all the time? Like when I was younger, sure, a show in Rome, I'm off. Show in Belfast, great. Now I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's good to stay home a little bit, you know, and work on my relationship or whatever. It's like, so that everything becomes a factor in a different way as you, as your career develops, as you develop as a person. A question from Wendy asks, uh, what can be done to ensure more women and minorities uh, work in the industry? Misha? Um, hire more women in minorities. <laughs> I think like, but you know, like Jeremy and I were talking about this a little, like he, you know, is now in a position where he's producer director and he's supervising other directors and is directly in a position to, to break in more women and minorities and, and is taking that responsibility seriously. And that is, you know, the same way you started this by saying Alan Poole changed your life, like to, um, to make sure you are focusing on women and minorities who have been sort of not allowed in to, to increase the voices of people. But the nice thing about that too, is it doesn't just, it's not like you're doing some charity work, like it actually makes your show better and more current and makes it better because there are more diverse voices contributing to the creative process. So I feel like that's um, a no brainer and I don't know why it's still so hard, but I, I also think one of the barriers is People are always, even with me, I, I'm still hustling and trying to get it because if I haven't done it, it's like, well, she hasn't done this. Can she do it? You know, and um, I was saying like, you can't compare female directors and female DPs and fe like you can't compare our reels to male reels and say, well, I'm just giving the best person for the job, the job, because that is just a way to keep the status quo, right? Like my... Um, my, if you put, even Jeremy and I, if you put our reels next to each other, I'm never going to get the Game of Thrones or the period, like I've, I haven't done the period show. I haven't done the big, it, like huge things. So they'll be like, oh, I'm going to hire Jeremy. But it's sort of when the person. By the way, I'll never get late night. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> True. Right. So I think it's in the, it's in the hands of a producer and that people who are hiring to be a little more creative than that and say, okay, well, what if, what if the guy who made Eclipse got a camera package? Could he direct something big like Rome? Obviously he, he did and he did it really well, but you know, how many years were we lost on work that Jeremy could have done because people didn't think he could do it because he hadn't done it, you know? So that kind of thinking is, I get it. There's a lot of money at stake. People are afraid, but um, 
I think that's why this producer director position is so great because you give the people who are worried the safety net of, well, there's this director overseeing it. So if this person blows it, he can step in and save it, you know, but it allows you to take a bigger risk. So then with that comes the responsibility of take a bigger risk, you know, and hire some people and, and try to pay attention to, um, like I remember looking at DP reels and all the female DP reels just didn't look as good as the male DP reels. And then I had to really think about that and realize my own bias, you know, and think, okay, so I called this DP and I said, hey, like, you know, you shot this movie, it looked like this. And she said, yeah, I had a bounce board. We didn't have any lighting package. So really I found out that she lit that whole movie with bounce cards and any night scene she shot, she literally had a flashlight and tinfoil. And I just was so blown away then and thought, oh, if she made it look like that, which still, you know, with, with nothing, then what could she do if we gave her a lighting package? And obviously she blew us all away with the lighting package. So I think it's just that, that step to think twice about um, what resources was someone given in this material they're presenting to you. And I would say also that I think at this point, it's like, there's no question that you have to try to achieve parity in a lot of these kind of things, because it's just, you just have to. And I think if you start with that, you know, perspective, then you start to realign a little bit, like what, what are your, what are the qualifications you're looking for? And it changes, I think now, because it's not so much just about, you know, depth of experience necessarily. It's also about sensibility and sensitivity and kind of, is somebody, you know, potentially right for this project in a, in a more deeper fundamental way. And then you, and you're looking for different things in their work and you can find it, you know, if you're looking for it, you can find it. And I think the people are so out there for, like there's no excuse for not doing it anymore. And I think that the lie that, you know, that the, there isn't talent on that side of things is, is, is being, you know, kind of debunked every day. Because, you know, you look at, you know, Pose, for example, where they brought in the huge number of trans writers and directors who have never been given a chance before and are excelling in the work. And it's like, you know, who's, you know, there's no excuse anymore for saying that there are not female directors and, produ and production designers and DOPs and, and everything. It's like, you just have to kind of look at work and, you know, and look at people in a different way. And it's like, sometimes you don't always have to, that sometimes it's exactly the same paradigm. But, you know, I think it's just, right now, it's just absolutely a given as it, as it should have been for a long time. Right. And you just, you, you make it work. You, you find the people. Thinking about your, your late night comment and how you, like, I don't know if, you're, if your struggle is breaking into comedy because now you've done so much serious drama that you must be a very serious filmmaker. <laughs> not a... I, 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 it's not just a few times that I've heard that I'm not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Or the work isn't the work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the work. So yeah, <laughs> definitely not a given that I'd be getting that kind of work. <laughs> you can swap some time, or you hire me, I'll yeah. hire you. How about that? Probably. That's how we have to do it. That's okay. that'll be done. <laughs> There's a Game of Thrones question here for you, Jeremy, from yeah. Kotlin. This is an interesting one. Um, when you do an episode of Game of Thrones and it takes place across multiple continents and there are other scenes at those locations in other episodes, how long does it take you to direct an episode like that? Are you like directing piecemeal across months? It's a, uh, a unique situation with Game of Thrones, unique to any show I've ever done, where the entire season is cross-boarded, meaning that um, it's not like you come in and do your two episodes, somebody comes in and do, does their two. It's like you, you're expected to be there for the entire run of the show, which could be six months. And so if the show is in Belfast, you're in Belfast. If the show is in Croatia and, it's a, and you need to be in Croatia, you're in Croatia. So there, the four directors or five directors, depending on the season, are kind of being moved around where it's expedient for the production. And so, you, um, so it's scheduled for the production eff efficacy rather than getting a director in and out. And so it's a, it's a very complex thing. So the entire cast, the entire production team is available 24 seven for six months to that show. And so sometimes you're working solidly for five days a week. Sometimes you're working one day a week, depending on whatever is going on. They, they help that situation by having two crews working all the time. So you have a more of a chance of working on any given day because there's usually one crew working full-time in Belfast and another crew working full-time in 
Iceland, Croatia, Spain, wherever. So it's, it's really complex. But basically, you know, to do two episodes, you're there for six months between prepping, shooting, editing. This just sounds like a, an, a nightmare to schedule. It's an, it would be a nightmare if you didn't have people as brilliant as the people who were actually doing it. Yeah. So you had Chris Newman and Bernie Caulfield who were producing that show on the ground and just understood scheduling in a way that, like, if you would look at these schedules, you'd have a migraine that you wouldn't believe because they're color coded and they're, it's hundreds of days of shooting in different countries and you're moving actors and directors and crews around and, and you know, just navigating that is, it is incredibly complicated. But there's, a, there's actually a great thing, a, a day in the life of Game of Thrones on HBO, this special that they did, which talks, speaks to that quite interestingly. And you get a sense of what's involved, but it is, um, it has been used to my experience. I hope it, I hope I get to do that again because it's amazing being part of this perfectly working clockwork machine but it could only be that way with the amazing people that they have doing it. Uh, question for you, Nisha, um, uh, from an anonymous uh, listener. You mentioned shadowing and fellowships. Was there someone who really championed you that made all the difference? Uh, I mean, everybody champions you in those things. It just didn't, I think the ones that are more successful are the ones where they guarantee you work at the end of them, which are harder and rarer to come by. But um, yeah, I think everybody's, everyone's trying and everybody's doing their best. It just is, it's tough for it to actually translate into something um, that's actually work for you unless it's guaranteed. Right. Um. Wendy, I don't know if you want to, either of you want to answer this. Wendy asks, what's the big, biggest directing mistake you ever made? Oh, for, oh, for well, let's see. Either of you. So many. <laughs> Jeremy? What can we say? <laughs> what are... I don't, I don't, I, I'm not going to say what it was exactly. And I probably had a few, but I would say like, you know, it's years of experience working with actors that gives, that gives you the language to speak with actors sometimes. And I think earlier in my career, you know, I, I kind of like, you know, I was working in my own little indie way with, you know, with mainly theater actors and in a, in a world that I felt quite comfortable. And then suddenly I was like, found myself working with, you know, Royal Shakespeare actors and movie stars and people like that and being a little intimidated sometimes at the very beginning. And it was an interesting thing to kind of like learn that some act, that all actors are different. All actors require different kinds of language. Some, some love, you know, quicker, faster, bigger, smaller. <laughs> some actors want, you know, obviously more <laughs> different kinds of direction than that. Um, it's like, it's really about kind of intuiting and then sometimes even just speaking with actors about what, what works for them and how they like, how they like to be directed. And it's just kind of learning a kind of, a breadth, working with a breadth of actors, you, you gain more confidence in how to, how to make that the best working relationship possible. And I think that was, that's, it was a learning curve over time to um, kind of feel excited and happy and great with working with anybody and not feel intimidated by people, but feel like it's a real collaboration and that you can, you and actors can do something great together. And, and so, so I would say those were the things that were the most for me, they were a big thing to learn. Someone did have a question about acting and working with actors. Uh, so Nisha, could you answer that? Your sort of process with working with actors? Oh my God, I think it's such a, I mean, it's so specific to the actor you're working with, right? Like it's about their process really and what they're, what's helpful to them. So I usually just start by uh, talking to them about like what is the most helpful to them because, um, you know, obviously, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but sometimes there's some actors who really love rehearsal and want to rehearse things again and again and again, and some actors who just want to keep it fresh and do that. Um, and it's, it's always interesting to me because I tend to, I think, direct more of ensemble pieces. And so every actor is usually coming with their own different uh, set of requirements. And then it's always challenging to direct them, giving them what they need while they're working with each other. Um, especially if those needs are opposing. So I don't know. I think it's just such as it's so hard to talk about in a general way because it's so specific to how you're working with each person. 
So when you come into a show and it's the first episode of a show you directed, but that show has been running for a while, then you know, it's, it's running like a well-oiled machine and everyone knows probably more about the project than you do on your first day directing. How do you get up to speed on people's different processes and the actors specifically like, so that you, know, you don't spend you know, several days learning it? You've got to kind of hit the ground running, right? Yeah, I think the only show I've done that on was um, was probably Shameless, and then Gir Girls was probably the most extreme example of that because my first episode was the series like finale of sorts, so that was pretty um, intense. But I I think I I only do sh direct shows if they've been up and running that I love and have watched, so I feel like I'm up and and in the um, breadth of knowledge of that show because I've studied it in a way that as a fan for so long. Um, but I think also I, I've been lucky to work on shows where they give the director freedom and respect to, to bring their own creativity to it. So it's not like I'm on a show where I've heard those nightmares where the actors are like, shut up, you're gone next week. I know more than you. And um, that sounds awful. And I'm so happy I've never worked on one of those shows. <laughs> This kind of segues nicely into our final question from Andrew and, and talking about how, you know, on the indie film set, director is at the top of the pecking order and it's uh, TV is a writer's medium. So how do you juggle that and make your mark in episodic when, you know, you're only on the show for two or three episodes, sometimes one episode. How, how do you put your thumbprint on it, you know, and leave a mark? Um. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the job of the episodic director in a way is to sort of absorb the DNA of that show into your system. And then if you can, to elevate it somehow um, or put a spin on it. But it's a fine line between, you know, kind of putting a spin on it and, and actually transgressing, you know, the, the language of what that show actually is. And so I think you, you learn over time how you can bring your own personality to bear on it and how you can, you know, hopefully elevate what's been established and, and bring a fresh eye without breaking it, like bending without breaking is kind of like the big thing. And they're really looking, I, I always feel like I'm hired or you're hired, like we are hired because hopefully we can do that, like we're known to be able to do that, that, you know, that you can, you know how to be um, kind of respectful of the show and the integrity of what it is, but at the same time, bring a new fresh eye that can, you know, kind of turn it around. And I think, you know, the cast is often looking for that. The producers are looking for that. The showrunners looking for that. I think a mistake that some directors made, and I've seen this on shows, is that they come in and they do like a perfectly decent job of something, but they'll never get rehired. And sometimes, like I, I, in the past, I would ask a, a showrunner, like, why wasn't that director brought back? And they'll say, well, you know, they did an okay job, but like they were a bit too pliable or they were too, you know, they, they were always asking, what should they do? And they, they didn't have their own kind of independent sense of what the show should be and what it could be. And I think they want you to have an issue and they want you to have your own voice. And, and to a uh, degree, to a degree. And then it is, it is a tricky line because you're right. Like you can't come in and reinvent the wheel on the show because then you also will be asked to leave very quickly because <laughs> they don't want, you know, they don't want you coming in and breaking all the rules of the aesthetics they've set, but also. They don't want you to be passive either. Yeah, I mean, even on a network show, I know Michael Spiller on um, the Mindy Project said, you know, I'm here, I'm the producer director, I could direct every episode, so show me why you're directing this one and I'm not. And it was such a great, like, supportive challenge, you know, to be like, don't phone it in because it's a network show. Like, we're aiming for something artistic and try to show me why you are here, you know. And that was a, I thought that was such a cool way to, to put it. But he also was there all the time to say like, you know, this part of the set's a nightmare or this part of the set no one's ever shot in or it wouldn't be interesting if we did something over here and then he just sort of disappeared, you know, so he was always kind of guiding a little and made you feel like there was a safety net. He wasn't going to let you fail. But for my first like network show, it was really nice to feel because it, it's scary doing your first network show. I had an interview with, you know, 17 different people had to say yes for me to get this show. And by the time you get it, you've had three or four of them say, everything's riding on this, by the way, if you blow this, you're back to square zero, you know, and if you do well, then we're gonna open up all these other shows for you to direct. And so 
you're just on that set with the pressure of the world and sweating and <laughs> freaking out and everybody doesn't let you forget how much is riding on it. And that's really, um, you know, thankfully I was at a point where I was like, okay, I can't got this. But if that were my first experience directing on an episodic, I don't know, it would have been very uh, crushing, I think. We are pretty much out of time, uh, but our final question to everyone here is just for some pandemic picks. Um, what you're watching, any, any recommendations for people out there? Um, I watch what Craig Fusse tells me to watch. <laughs> no, I've been watching uh, Match Made in Heaven. That's like, uh, or Made in Heaven, I think it's called. It's an Indian um, show on Netflix that is just my guilty pleasure right now. <laughs> if I, but I also am watching very late at night and falling asleep during things. Indian so. Matchmaker. Sure. Indian Matchmaker is also fantastic. I haven't watched all of it yet, um, but I, before that I was watching uh, Made in Heaven. <laughs> Jeremy? Um, well, I've watched a lot of the sort of more zeitgeisty things that people are watching, like Normal People, and I May Destroy oh, You, oh, you know, like of course. Years, and years, uh, years, uh, years and Years, which is the Russell oh, yes. show, which I love, 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 love. That's fantastic. Um, but I'm also kind of like being re really attracted to watching a lot of half hour kind of things that are like, sometimes you just need, you know, the show before you go to bed that makes you feel all right. And, you know, I've been watching Search Party, catching up with that, which I'm totally loving. And I watch Feel Good and Work in Progress. These are all shows that are kind of fresh and I don't know, they just, they're, uh, they, they, they feel good right now, <laughs> these shows. Uh, well, my picks would be for everyone watching to check out, uh, go back, way back, and check out Six Feet Under on HBO or HBO Max for some of Jeremy's work, and uh, check out Late Night on, on Prime. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> last feature, or last but one, because you have another one since then. But, I but know. It's, I uh, Late Night, it's terrific. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining us. Uh, this has been great. We do have to bring it to an end. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time with another coffee talk. But for now, I want to thank Jeremy Podeswa. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. And Nisha Ganatra. Thanks, Nisha. Thank you. Stay safe and come back soon.